Ken, I would like to make a, a, a little jump in time until the time when, when you met uh, Treya. Sure. So, uh, when was it? Yeah. Um... Because, you know, that for me, it's, it, this is a... I hope it's fine that I'm asking you, but uh, I have to tell you this, this was my first meeting with you was about this book, you know. So I found out very much later about your philosophic work. Right. Um, I only, I've only uh, really commented on Treya publicly um, one or two times. And I'd be glad to do so now. Um, but one of the reasons is that um, it's, it's by far one of the most uh, profound periods in my life. And my relationship with Treya changed me in so many unbelievably deep and profound ways. And in some ways, it was um, just kind of um, even sort of bigger realizations of several things that I uh, already knew and that I was already living. But they became enormously accelerated in these circumstances. Um, and it was, I think, because from the very beginning, it was... It was a situation that was framed by a constant awareness of, of death. I mean, it really was life and death. And so it really was, you can't just have, you know, academic ideas here. Mm -hmm. This is life and death, and you can't get around that. And this, this happened, by the way. We were married. And just 10 days after we were married, we discovered she had cancer. And the kind of cancer she had was so virulent that the average... If you... The number of people that lived, 5.0 years. Mm -hmm. was exactly 0%. So mm -hmm. in other words, you can expect five years if you did absolutely everything right that was known at the time. So that was serious. And that was, in a sense, the test of both of our uh, beliefs, our awareness, our whatever sp spiritual realizations we had had, um, by that time, I had been uh, intensely meditating um, for at least 10, 12 years. Um, she also um, had, a, had a major meditative uh, practice. And one of the things that, um, just speaking for myself, um, it was an extraordinary deepening of awareness mm -hmm. um, because of my uh, practice, which I I was sort of practicing all the world's religions, but I had particularly been focusing on Zen Buddhism because, again, there was this thing called Satori, and I, you know, and I just really wanted to know what that was. Um, and over the course of over a decade or so, I had ended up... Uh, having several satori um it was everything i thought it was um it certainly helped with the writing uh that i was doing but that even got deepened and accelerated during uh the course of treya and one of the things that happened was as soon as we found out that she had cancer um i just threw my whole life over to being of service to her. And up to that point, because we had met when I was in my early 30s, 
And so I had been writing, you know, literally every day um, for about 10 years. And, and then in terms of spiritual practice, it was more and more that kind of what happens with awareness as you meditate and do spiritual practices. It becomes, in Sanskrit, what's called nete nete. I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this, I'm not that. And it's just a whole process of disidentification with any small, finite entity that, that you identify with. And the traditions maintain, of course, that that's a case of mistaken identity because that's not who you really are. Um, you can, like, sort of write out a whole list of things describing yourself. Like if somebody right now says, okay, describe who you are. And you might say, well, I'm, my name is this. I'm this old. I weigh this much. I was born here. Uh, I got educated here. Uh, I'm in a relationship now. Um, I work at this job. You know, and you can just list all of these things. But the traditions would say, uh, just notice that those are all objects that you can see. Now, you have another self, and it was the self that's actually seeing that. So all the things that you saw are fine, but they're not your real self. Mm. They're your relative self. But now who is that seer? Who is that witness of all of that? And one hint is it's nete, nete. It's not that thing. It's not that thing. It's not that thing. It's the thing that sees all those things. It's a seer. It can't be seen. And so this is just a pure awareness. It's a pure consciousness. And it's sometimes called your true self because it, it's a, you, you have to still talk in dualistic terms a little bit. Um, but Zen master Shiba Yama called this true self absolute subjectivity and that just means it's just that pure subject not anything that can be seen as an object so that just pure awareness and so it's the self that was watching you describe yourself except what you were describing wasn't the real self it was an object self a small self but the big self is ever-present timeless uh, radically open and radically free but it's not bound to or identified with anything so it's a radical freedom from all of that and one of the things that happens in any of the paths of, of great liberation any of the great mystical paths is that when you do have um, one of your first profound satori's or awakening experiences or enlightenment experiences is this realization of just that pure self that pure i amness that isn't any little thing here or thing there and and you realize that that's a radical freedom um and it also happens to be the sort of deeply intimate with every thing that's arising so it's not any one thing so it's nete nete but it's everything it, it's absolutely embracing everything and so that's always held to be um a relief from suffering a relief from angst a relief from fear the upanishads say wherever there is other there is mm -hmm. fear mm -hmm. And that's right. And, and the little separate self is always separating itself from, you know, other things. And since there's other, there's fear. Because those other things can hurt it. It can kill it. It can squash you. It can frustrate you and, and so on. But when you are one with that other, as well as one with this self, when you're one with literally everything that's arising, there is no other. So there's nothing that can hurt you, literally. There's nothing outside of you. 
that could run into you or crash into you and cause cause problems. And for the same reason, there's there's a fundamental lack of um, addictive desire or grasping because again, there's nothing outside of you. It's all arising within your awareness. That had become quite obvious to me uh, over the past 10, 12, 15 years. But it got a particularly deepened realization um, with Treya. And I would say there were sort of two parts. Um, but one was the sense of freedom, and then one was the sense of all embracing love. And I'll come back to the love. But the freedom was up until I met Treya. I literally had spent pretty much every day of my life um, writing. Um, and I, 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 get, I get up, well, I still do, but I wake up around three or four in the morning, get up, immediately go to the desk and start writing. Um, and I just start pouring down and just keep going as long as I can sit up and write. <laughs> and when my fingernails start getting purple and my lips start getting purple, I just have to stop. Um, but then I'll go back and do the same thing the next day. So when Trey had cancer, I just stopped doing all of that, mm. uh, really for the first time in my adult life. And even though I'd had these relatively deep experiences of uh, Satori and Nete, Nete, and, and all of that, I found that in, in, at a very deep level, it was very hard for me to let go of, it, it wasn't the activity, it was the subtle identity that I had created around doing that. That's what I was, was this writer. And when I stopped doing that, that really was sort of the last major thing that I had a strong identity with, and that was just taken away mm -hmm. and for about a year it was extremely hard it was a very difficult situation and i really was just undergoing uh, the sort of death of that particular small older self and i, I wasn't using capacity to do the activity but i just was no longer radically identified with it and sort of grasping onto it. Um, so that was what was kind of left of my separate self sense. And, and as I had to just let go of that, then I was forced to just see it as an object. I was forced to just become aware of it and rest more in just pure awareness. Now, Treya was doing a similar thing because she was also dying. Mm -hmm. And she immediately, as she found that news out, went into an increased meditative practice because she knew what was happening. So here's both of us dying, mm -hmm. literally, from moment to moment. I just always say that, I mean, right up until the literal moment she physically died. I always said that, that the two of us grew up together and we died together. Mm. And that's what happened. And so in the midst of this sort of dying to these smaller selves, there's, if you look at, okay, now there's this pure awareness or pure consciousness or ultimate ground of being that you're becoming is more in touch with. Usually it's most of the um, mystics, I don't like that term, but most of the mystic East and West, Buddhist, Vedanta, Christian mystics, um, maintain that you can't really describe that ground of being 
because any concepts that we use mm. make sense only in terms of their opposites. So even even you know infinite versus finite, happy versus sad, good versus evil, pleasure versus pain. Um, almost all of our concepts uh, are part of a dualistic scheme, but reality doesn't have any opposites because it's radically all inclusive. So you can't even say that without a contradiction. And so that's why people like Nagarjuna and the whole emptiness notion in Buddhism. It's basically saying, um, take any quality you want to define ultimate reality with consciousness, being, bliss, awareness, whatever you want. And in fact, the real reality, which the guards are called emptiness, shunyata, is neither, take any one of those terms to use, we'll just call that X, whatever it is. And the Garshans just had treatise after treatise demonstrating, using any number of words for X, you know, consciousness, bliss, being, whatever it was. And he demonstrated that the ultimate reality is neither X, nor not X, nor both, nor neither. In other words, it's just a radical cleaning out of all your concepts, all the, because they're all dualistic. And then at, the more you do that, the more you find that all that's left in existence is, again, just this pure awareness not labeled, not conceptualized, just a pure awareness. It also happens to embrace everything that's, that's arising. So we were both going through that process, even though most of the, of the great and, and sophisticated mystics like Nagarjuna said, okay, you can't really describe this thing. All you can do is directly awaken to it. But until that time, any description you use is just wrong. It won't work. Um, and, but you find common metaphors that are often used to describe it. So even Eastern traditions will often refer to that ultimate state as sat chit ananda, being, consciousness, bliss. Okay, um, another famous trinity is the good, the true, and the beautiful. That kind of works. Probably the single most famous is God is love. Mm -hmm. And it's a special kind of love. I mean, we have sort of what you call small love and big love. So small love is I love this, I don't love that. Um, I love this, ooh, I hate that. So it's another set of you know, dualistic opposites. And most people know love, small love. They love this, they don't love that. But big love is radically all-inclusive. So it includes small love. It also includes hate. It embraces both of those fully. And as a matter of fact, everything that arises moment to moment is embraced fully by love. Because love is just another name for the ground of everything that's existing. So under circumstances like that, you have to realize how really, how really um, sharp, major, uh, major intense um, big love is. So it'll say things like, I love that mountain, I love those trees, I love those clouds. Um, I love that car, I love those buildings, I love my friends. But it'll also say, I love the ozone hole, and I love terrorist attacks, and I love seeing people suffer and die. I love global warming, and I love, I mean, literally, it's the ground of all being. And so everything that's arising, is arising out of this infinite love. And then you have separate, okay, I'm in the relative realm, okay, I really don't like global warming, and I'm gonna work to stop that. 
but it's on the ground of love because the ground of being is the ground of all being. It, it, the ground of being doesn't just isn't just a ground to the stuff you like, and then the stuff you don't like doesn't have a ground of being. No, it does. Um, even in the Bible, um, uh, the quote is, um, I, the Lord, make the light to fall on the good and the bad alike. I, the Lord, do all these things. Um, and so that's what big love is. As Treya and I were dying um, and realizing, nete, nete, I mean, I'm not that, I'm not that. Um, we were also opening to this really deep, unconditional love. And we first, in a, it might sound paradoxical, but we first learned how to do it by loving each other. Mm -hmm. And that love was so, it just for both of us, <sighs> we had all loved before and deeply. But for both of us, it was just nothing like this ever. Uh, it, it just blew us away. And, and it, it seemed to be that love that was just so deep. It was connecting with the entire ground and it just spilled out of us and embraced the entire universe. And this is happening to me who has now not been writing. Well, I, after that, that first year, well, I stopped writing the day she got cancer. And then I went through a year of extremely difficult adjustment where I really had to die to that self. And then for the next four years that she lived, I was simply there 24 hours a day serving her. And that's all I did. And so I'm getting a lesson in how to apply this love in a selfless service. Um, and so these things are all kind of moving forward. Um, and it's moving forward in, in, in terms of this understanding of, of, of both universal freedom and universal love. And then it's also being applied just directly to this person and to just this event and just what we were doing here. Um, but it became deeper and deeper um, and my love and care for her um, just, it just kept deepening the whole time. Um, and it was mutually reinforcing um, the love that we would feel from the other person would make us feel worthy to receive that kind of love. Um, because you just, most people just, when you're met with something like that, the common response is, well, I don't deserve that, whatever that is. And if you really knew me better, you'd know what a rotten person I was and you couldn't possibly love me the way, the way you are now. Um, but that was, that just, it was sort of the work that we did. Um, and it was extraordinary. Treya was, one of the reasons that she was a teacher for me was she had this almost absolute transparency of her own individual self. And one of the ways that showed up is that she literally had no secrets. And I found this out in um, an unbelievable way um, after she had died. Um, she had asked me to write a book about this ordeal to try and convey some of the things that had happened. Um, it wasn't something that I would have 
I would have myself chosen to do, but I was fine. I promised her I'd do it, and I did in the book Grace and Grit. And uh, Treya, for the whole time I knew her, and apparently stretching back several years, she kept journals, and she made entries in those journals almost every day. And I always just noticed that it wasn't like she would, you know, get in a corner and, you know, close the shades and, and you know, do it all hidden. But it just seemed to be really important time of hers and time that she could just be alone and focus on what was happening for her. And I'd actually decided that when she died, I was going to simply destroy the journals. I wasn't going to read them. I wasn't going to let anybody else read them uh, because I felt that that was just her private time. And the last night that I carried her upstairs before she died, there was a stack of her journals in the corner. And as we walked by them, all she did was she pointed to the journals and she said, you'll need those. Mm -hmm. And I knew exactly what she meant. Um, that if I was going to write this book, I would need to be able to include her thoughts about things. So I would have to read the journals. And she was saying, she knew I wasn't going to. And so she was saying, no, you need, it's okay. So I got those Reading them was one of the most difficult things that I've ever done. But what increasingly surprised me deeply is that there wasn't really a single major thing in her journals that she hadn't told me. Now, I, I think of myself as open. I think most people are open. But if I'm writing journals, I'm going to say one or two things about people that I'm not going to tell them. You know, I just, and this person, oh, I love him, but by the way, he's, you know, he's a complete idiot or something like that. Absolute transparency. She had no secrets. And I think really it was in part because she had this extraordinary awareness that just permeated her being and just made it radically transparent. Um, I never saw her lie. Of all of the horrifying medical treatment she went through, I never once saw her afraid. I never saw fear in her. And it was because of this radical openness. And that's what people who actually met her that's why they fell in love. It, it was just an immediate, ah. Uh, and one of the most common things that I would see, and I loved it, and I would see this even like with spiritual teachers. You know, we'd be in line to talk to a famous spiritual teacher or something. And I would talk, and it was great, and we connected. And the tray would start talking to them, and I would always watch them, and the teachers were just like, and it's like, what is this? And then, and when, and then she'd get out of line, and they'd always turn to their aides and go, okay, who was that? And I'd go, oh, well, it's, yeah. And they go, yeah, right. Um, that was what you would like to become. But, um, so that was a, a, a stunning, constant lesson for me. It, it's just that kind of presence, that kind of, of integrity, and that kind of, of honesty is radically rare. And she was also one of the literally two or three most physically beautiful women I'd ever met in my life. So I, I felt that even with the cancer and the difficulty and all of that, uh, best thing that ever happened to me. And I am so thankful for those five years that we had together and 
the thankfulness of that outweighs the incredible sadness uh, for losing her. But the good stuff was so overwhelmingly good. I'm just forever, ever grateful for that. Um, changed me deeply. Um, made me, I think, just a much better version of, of what I was. And I was a relatively good version. <laughs> uh, but this was, a, this was a super education in, in, in being an authentic human being. 